Good morning, Pastor Rob here, Coffee with Rob. I hope everybody's doing good. Uh, we are beginning Mark chapter 3 this morning in our study of the book of Mark. This is study number 10, where we're doing pretty good. So, hope everybody's doing well. Um, let's go ahead and get started. In Mark chapter 3, it says, Another time Jesus went to the synagogue. So, we know he's done this before. We know that he dealt with the demoniac. Uh, in the earlier chapters and cast a demon out of a man in the synagogue. And so he goes another time, he goes to the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was here. Now this is interesting because in uh, Leviticus, it says that a person with a deformity cannot approach the temple uh, holy place or so he would be kind of rejected from, to come into the temple and to worship uh, because he had a defect. Uh, and that's a, uh, Leviticus 21, 18 through 24, uh, which is very interesting. So this is a big deal for this man. If he gets cured and he has the ability then as a, as a Jew, as a person that's made whole to, to completely worship or have all rights to worship uh, after he is healed. Because right now with a defect, and let me read that. I looked that up today. <clears throat> Leviticus uh, uh, yeah, was it 21. 18 to 24, Leviticus 21, 18 to 24, it says, no man who has any defect may come near, no man who is blind, lame, disfigured, or disformed, no man with a crippled foot or hand, that's interesting, this is what we're going to talk about today, no man with a crippled foot or hand, or who is hunched over, dwarfed, or has an eye defect, no descendant of Aaron, the priest, or has any defect, is to come near the present or to present the offerings made to the Lord by fire. He has a defect. He must not come near to offer the food of his God. He may eat the food of his God, but because he has a defect, he must not go near the curtain. So this man was had limits on his worship. Uh, and so, because uh, he had a shriveled hand, he had a defect. And that's in Leviticus 21. So another time Jesus went to the synagogue and there was a man with a shriveled hand. Now, some of them were looking. We know this is the Pharisees. This is the Sadducees. These are people that are trying to bring accusation against Jesus Christ. Um, they find him as a threat. And actually, Pilate, when they crucified him, he realized, he says, they crucified this man out of envy, not because he really did anything wrong. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely. Imagine being under a microscope your whole life. That would be horrible. Uh, to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Of course he's going to heal him on the Sabbath because that's the right thing to do. And Jesus is showing he is Lord even of the Sabbath. He is Lord over demons. He's Lord over uh, defects. He's Lord over disabilities. Uh, he's Lord over all, all things, disease and all these things. And so this is just another example of his authority over the Sabbath. And remember, the, the, the rule here is obviously there are laws that God wants us to follow, or wanted them to follow. But let common sense prevail. I mean, within reason, let common sense prevail. Because this is a very common sense uh, situation that these guys want to enforce the law on. So, and, and you know, I won't get any. Anyway, some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. So here comes this man with a withered hand. And, I, and I, there's also uh, parallels to this in Luke 6 and Matthew 12. In Luke 6, it actually says it was the man's right hand. And if you do a Greek study on that word, it's actually considered the tool that people use to accomplish a purpose. So because his right hand was not working, this man could not work. Uh, he couldn't provide for himself. The tool that he would use, because most people were right hand dominant, uh, was broken. He couldn't go out and do the things that he hoped to accomplish, as uh, not only in work and provision, but even in worship. So this is a big deal for this man to come forward with this shriveled hand, and it's his right hand, and that's in Luke 6, by the way. So Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. This is an example of God trying to make and uh, just show everybody his heart to really show what really matters. Man, stand up. Let everybody look at you. Let's use some common sense here. And stand up in front of everyone. And Jesus asked them. Now, there's going to be a crowd there, but there's also going to be Pharisees and Sadducees. So he's asking them. Hopefully somebody will speak up properly, but nobody does. Which is lawful on the Sabbath to do? 
to do good or to do evil? Simple question, do good or do evil, to save a life or to kill. This is very, this is very important and very specific. Jesus is always very specific and strategic with his words and his situations. To save a life or to kill, this is an opportunity to save a life. To give the man an opportunity by healing his hand to go out and provide for himself. And these guys are, are very hard-hearted. We'll look at that in a minute. They don't care. They only care that Jesus is a threat to their power. So, which is lawful to do on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill? And that's very foreshadowing because about what we're, uh, based on what we're about to read. But they remained silent. They were quiet. And look at this now. There's always this thing in verse 5 of Mark chapter 3. You're going to see Jesus, cop, and I'm not going to say cop and attitude, that's not the right word, but you're going to see that we don't worship a wimpy Savior. A lot of people think Jesus was gushy, he's just soft in the middle, he's like the Pillsbury Doughboy, you poke him and he goes, Boo, you know, that's not Jesus. Jesus was very stern, very bold, he was breaking up the status quo. Some people might consider him a rebel of the time, but for all the right reasons. He was out for a cause, and that is to draw men back to the proper sense of worship and recognizing who he was as God in the flesh in his hypostatic union. So Mark 3 verse 5, he looked around and he looked at them in anger. Now that's interesting. And so we're going to look at these words in a second. He looked at them in anger, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. So that's a big statement. If you have it, you might want to circle that. Do a study on that verse. Very interesting to know that Jesus is not a wimp. Uh, actually, I've seen a book even, and I have it. It's called Jesus Was an Army Ranger. I love that. Uh, and so he looked around at the man in anger and deeply distressed. So I looked up these words. The word here is orgies. It means he started to swell up with wrath. He's looking around going, you know, is anybody going to say anything? Is anybody going to speak up for the right thing to do here? And, you know, you've, you've been there. You've seen somebody do something. And you're, all of a sudden your emotion starts to gather, it starts to get bigger, and then you, then you get mad, you get mad, you get angry. But this, is, um, this isn't just anger as an emotion. This is Jesus getting angry, like a righteous indignation. For all the right reasons, he is angry. Um, swelling up with wrath, anger, passion, and then it goes even further. Look how it grows. Anger, wrath, some passion. He has a passion for people. Uh, he has a passion for people to have soft hearts, a kind and compassionate hearts. And then it goes into punishment and vengeance, if you look at the word the way it's, the way it's used. So he has basically a justified righteous indignation, a justified righteous anger at the situation. Basically, if we just spoke plainly, it's, hey guys, common sense. Is it right to heal this man or not? He's got a withered hand. And actually, if you look at the word withered, it's like, the equivalent of leaving a grape out in the sun for several days until it shrivels up even worse than a raisin. That's what his hand looked like. Imagine having your right hand, the one that we're most common to use, the right hand dominant, being withered. It's not only is it a deformity, it's a defect, and it's a disability. And you would think that people in the synagogue, the religious leaders who claim to love God, would say, oh man, yeah, heal this guy, please. But that ain't what they're doing, because their hearts are hardened. And Jesus looks around, he gets angry. Come on, man. What's wrong with you all? And so he gets mad. He gets a righteous indignation. And you can have a righteous indignation too. For the right reasons, it's okay to be angry at something that's, you know, real unfair or unjust. It's okay to be righteously angry. So uh, it goes into uh, Orgas. He is righteously angry. He is uh, sympathetic. He has a soft heart to this man. It's Siloponimenos, Sinopomenos. I don't know how to say that word. My, my apologies. He's moved with grief and sympathy. And so he's kind of like brokenhearted at the man. That's number one. At the man, he's, he's, he's upset. He's empathetic towards this man having this problem. But he's even more sympathetic towards his church or his synagogue at the time. Obviously, the church would be now. The, the synagogue in the time isn't properly operating. Oh, man, this is my, this is my father's house. This is where people should come and be healed. This is where people could come and be loved, provided for, experience compassion, experience fellowship, friendship, koinonia, as it would be the word, a fellowship of believers. And Jesus is sad because none of that's occurring. And, you know, eventually he'll cleanse 
or clear out the temple for those reasons. He's moved with Greece, grief. He's sympathetic. And I also was thinking about this when he was on the cross as he's being crucified. What does he say? Father, forgive them. They have no clue what they're doing. And they really didn't. People didn't. They were just so enraged. And your emotions, you know, not righteous indignation, but when your emotions get out of control, you can do things that you know you probably shouldn't have done. And there's often time where you're regretful when you react out of emotion. But anyway, Jesus is, is uh, righteously indignant. He's very sympathetic towards the man and very sympathetic towards the synagogue he's in because he's like, man, this should be a place of compassion and it's just broken. So he, he looked around uh, at them in anger and he was deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. And actually the word there means hardened hearts. They were just hard hearted people, very calloused. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand and he stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Uh, basically brand new, just as good as the le uh, his right hand is. So remember, it's his right hand. So now his right hand is completely restored, just like his his left hand. And now he can, it's usable. He can provide for himself. He can fully worship. His disability is gone. How many of us with disabilities, me being one of those, you know, not as, not as severe as most people, but literally it'd be nice to have your disabilities removed. That'd be fantastic. And, and you know what? This just shows Jesus is, you know, has authority over demons, over disease, over um, defo uh, did I say deformities, deformities, disabilities, and the one thing that I even wanted to throw in, even denominations. I mean, so many people have denominational elitism. If you're not a Nazarene, if you're not a Methodist, if you're not a Pentecostal, you're not going to heaven. You know what? You know who, who glories in that and the division of the churches? The devil. He loves to know that we're divided. Uh, now, if you can have a, a disagree on some things and still be uh, brothers in Christ, that's one thing. But usually the, usually the denominations are very divisive. And so he is even Lord over denomination. So demons, disease, deformities, disabilities, and denominations. So I don't care what denomination you're in. If you're not in Christ Jesus, you've got a problem. And if you're judging other denominations, unless they're worshiping outside of the parameters of the Bible. That's one, that's another thing. Or bringing in additional, there's faiths to bring in their own Bibles and their own books that they worship. Now that would be outside of Christ. But in Christ, we should all be united. Jesus wanted united us to be united and Paul wanted us to be united. But here we have this division within the synagogue and law abiders um, and, and so on. And so anyway, I just wanted to look at that real quick. But he looked around in anger, deeply distressed. He healed the man's hand. But look at what happens. The Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Now, there's a severe problem. Why are there demons in the synagogue? Well, here's a problem. The, the leaders are corrupt. The hearts of these people are hardened. They're not worshiping God. They're going through the motions. Churches today can do the same thing. Why aren't people getting saved? Why aren't there revivals? Why aren't things happening? I tell you what, being a pastor was the most difficult job I've ever had in my life because everybody knew better than me. Everybody knew the word better than me. And all I did when I preached, sometimes I don't even think they heard what I said. All they were doing was putting me under a microscope trying to figure out what I was saying inc incorrectly. Meanwhile, the church was growing and we were building a new building. But, um, you know, we were baptizing hundreds of people. Um, so I don't get it. But anyway, I just had enough of it. And I said, I'm not doing it anymore because I just couldn't take the stress. But but this is what's going on. This, people are judging people. Um, and, the, and so how, how corrupt were they? The Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians. Who are the Herodians? Herodians were like Jews that were, um, uh, they had their allegiance to the Herods, which would be the leaders of the time. For example, Herod the Great ruled from B.C. to probably around 4 A.D. when Jesus Christ was born. He was Herod the Great. He ruled all of the Levant. He ruled all of Israel under Roman authority or with Roman authority. He ruled it all, Herod the Great. And he had the, he was the one that killed all the children two and under trying to kill the Christ. After he died, this would be the time of Herod Antipas, which would be the son of Herod. And uh, because of the power that Herod the Great held, Rome didn't like that. So they divided uh, Israel into four uh, different territories and then gave each one of them their own Herod. That way they weren't so powerful. Herod the Great was the last king, real true king to rule the whole area. And now this is Herod Antipas. He would be considered a tetrarch, which means he ruled over a fourth 
of the kingdom. And then there was like Philip and Salome and, and some others. Um, so Herod Archelaus, they, they ruled as a team, not maybe even as a team, but they were divided. You know, the quickest way to conquer a situation is divide everybody. And that's what they did. Rome had greater authority now that the kingdom was divided than they did when Herod the Great ruled the whole kingdom. So these are the people loyal to the Herods. Um, so they have the Pharisees who are supposed to be loyal to God, law enforcers, law providers, teachers of the law um, with compassion, which they did not have any longer. Now, you, when they have a common enemy, Jesus Christ. So now they're going to get together with somebody formerly they may not even hang out with, but now they're going to, and Pilate did this with Herod uh, when, they were, when they were trying Christ. Well, they didn't get along until they chose to crucify Christ or to come together and rule over Christ. And so now you have the Pharisees joining with the Herods. And what are they plotting? They're not plotting, hey, how can we do better? How can we heal more hands? How can we feed more people? How can we cast out more demons? They're not doing that whatsoever. They're plotting on how to kill Jesus Christ. So when Jesus said their hearts were hardened, he was correct. And when he saw there was no compassion, he was correct. And when he cleansed the temple, he was correct. And when he came into Jerusalem and wept over it, he was 100% correct. He, he wept over Jerusalem. He wept over Lazarus. He hated the pain that was being caused. Uh, and, and when the temple and the tabernacles were supposed to be um, you know, a place of refuge and joy and light in the darkness, they were not. They were they were just buildings of corruption and churches can be the same way. We're supposed to be a light, a light on a hill, a united people different than the world uh, leading the way. I heard some churches go to corporations to learn how to lead. We should be the example of how to lead as churches. Good leadership, proper leadership, leadership in line, surrendered to Christ, under Christ and leading for the greater good of all the people. People should be coming to the churches to learn how to lead. And that's not what's happening today either. So anyway, that's Mark chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 6. Um, just looking, just a review. I think that was about it. Just understanding that um, Jesus was in the synagogue once more. He has authority over disease. He has authority over deformity, over disability, over demons, and over denominations. And then finally, uh, with the end, basically... They, the uh, the authorities that be at the time, the religious authorities decided it's time to kill him. This is Mark chapter 3, verse 6, and, and they are successful, we know, towards the end. But anyway, that's the lesson for today, Mark chapter 3, and we'll begin at verse 7 tomorrow.